Mr. Bookman here. Before I go ahead and start today's audiobook, do me one small favor. Go ahead and subscribe to the channel. And if you like today's book, make sure you do give it a thumbs up. Also, check out the comments for discussions. But more importantly, make sure you look in the description. You're going to see a link in there that's going to give you access to over 200 ebooks. Now, let's dive right into today's book. A Tale of the Good Old Times from Pearl Fishing Choice Stories from Dickens Household Words. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Charles Dickens' 200th Anniversary Collection, Volume 1. A Tale of the Good Old Times from Pearl Fishing Choice Stories from Dickens's Household Words by Charles Dickens. An alderman of the ancient borough of Beetlebury, and churchwarden of the parish of St. Wolfstan's in the said borough, Mr. Blenkinsop might have been called, in the language of the sixteenth century, a man of worship. This title would probably have pleased him very much, it being an obsolete one, and he entertaining an extraordinary regard for all things obsolete or thoroughly deserving to be so. He looked up with profound veneration to the griffins which formed the waterspouts of St. Wolfstan's church, and he almost worshipped an old boot under the name of a blackjack, which on the affidavit of a forsworn broker he had bought for a drinking vessel of the sixteenth century. Mr. Blenkinsop even more admired the wisdom of our ancestors than he did their furniture and fashions. He believed that none of their statutes and ordinances could possibly be improved upon, and in this persuasion had petitioned Parliament against every just or merciful change which, since he had arrived at man's estate, had been made in the laws. He had successively opposed all the Beetlebury improvements, gas, waterworks, infant schools, mechanics institute and library. He had been active in an agitation against any measure for the improvement of the public health, and being a strong advocate of intramural interment, was instrumental in defeating an attempt to establish a pretty cemetery outside Beetlebury. He had successfully resisted a project for removing the pig market from the middle of the high street. Through his influence, the shambles, which were corporation property, had been allowed to remain where they were namely, close to the town hall, and immediately under his own and his brethren's noses. In short, he had regularly, consistently, and nobly done his best to frustrate every scheme that was proposed for the comfort and advantage of his fellow creatures. For this conduct he was highly esteemed and respected, and, indeed, his hostility with any interference of disease had procured him the honour of a public testimonial shortly after the presentation of which, with several neat speeches, the cholera broke out in Beetlebury. The truth is that Mr. Blenkinsop's views on the subject of public health and popular institutions were supposed to be economical, though they were in truth desperately costly, and so pleased some of the ratepayers. Besides, he withstood ameliorations, and defended nuisances and abuses with all the heartiness of an actual philanthropist. Moreover, he was a jovial fellow, a boon companion, and his love of antiquity leaned particularly towards old ale and old port wine. Of both of these beverages he had been partaking rather largely at a visitation dinner, where, after the retirement of the bishop and his clergy, Festivities were kept up till late, under the presidency of the deputy registrar. One of the last to quit the crown and mitre was Mr. Blenkinsop. He lived in a remote part of the town, whither, as he did not walk exactly in a straight line, it may be allowable, perhaps, to say that he bent his course. Many of the dwellers in Beetlebury High Street, awakened at half-past twelve on that night, by somebody passing below singing, not very distinctly, with a jolly full bottle let each man be armed, were indebted, little as they may have suspected it, to Alderman Blenkinsop for their serenade. In his homeward way stood the Market Cross, a fine medieval structure supported on a series of circular steps by a groined arch, which served as a canopy to the stone figure of an ancient Burgess. This was the effigies of Winken de Vokes, 
once mayor of Beetlebury and a great benefactor to the town, in which he had founded almshouses and a grammar school, A.D. 1440. The post was formerly occupied by St. Wolfstan, but De Vocus had been removed from the town hall in Cromwell's time and promoted to the vacant pedestal, vice Wolfstan demolished. Mr. Blenkinsop highly revered this work of art, and he now stopped to take a view of it by moonlight. In that doubtful glimmer it seemed almost lifelike. Mr. Blenkinsop had not much imagination, yet he could well-nigh fancy he was looking upon the veritable Winken, with his bonnet, beard, furred gown and staff, and his great book under his arm. So vivid was this impression that it impelled him to apostrophize the statue. "'Fine old fellow,' said Mr. Blenkinsop. "'Rare old buck. We shall never look upon your like again. Ah, the good old times, the jolly good old times!' No times like the good old times, my ancient worthy. No such times as the good old times. And pray, sir, what times do you call the good old times? In distinct and deliberate accents answered, according to the positive affirmation of Mr. Blenkinsop, subsequently made before divers witnesses, the statue. Mr. Blenkinsop is sure that he was in the perfect possession of his senses. It is certain that he was not the dupe of ventriloquism, or any other illusion. The value of these convictions must be a question between him and the world, to whose perusal the facts of his tale, simply as stated by himself, are here submitted. When first he heard the statue speak, Mr. Blenkinsop says, he certainly experienced a kind of a sudden shock, a momentary feeling of consternation. But this soon abated in a wonderful manner. The statue's voice was quite mild and gentle, not in the least grim, had no funeral twang in it, and was quite different from the tone a statue might be expected to take by anybody who had derived his notions on that subject from having heard the representative of the class in Don Giovanni. "'Well, what times do you mean by the good old times?' repeated the statue, quite familiarly. The church warden was able to reply with some composure, that such a question coming from such a quarter had taken him a little by surprise. "'Come, come, Mr. Blenkinsop,' said the statue. "'Don't be astonished. Tis half-past twelve, and a moonlit night, as your favourite police, the sleepy and infirm old watchman, says. Don't you know that we statues are apt to speak when spoken to at these hours? Collect yourself. I will help you to answer my own questions. Let us go back step by step.' and allow me to lead you. To begin, by the good old times, do you mean the reign of George the Third? The last of them, sir, replied Mr. Blankensop, very respectfully, I am inclined to think, were seen by the people who lived in those days. I should hope so, the statue replied. Those the good old times? What, Mr. Blankensop, when men were hanged by dozens, almost weekly, for paltry thefts, when a nursing woman was dragged to the gallows with a child at her breast, for shoplifting to the value of a shilling, when you lost your American colonies, and plunged into war with France, which, to say nothing of the useless bloodshed it cost, has left you saddled with the national debt. Surely you will not call these the good old times, will you, Mr. Blenkinsop? Not exactly, sir, no. On reflection, I don't know that I can answered Mr. Blenkinsop. He had now, it was such a civil, well-spoken statue, lost all sense of the preternatural horror of his situation, and scratched his head just as if he had been posed in argument by an ordinary mortal. "'Well, then,' resumed the statue, "'my dear sir, shall we take the two or three reigns proceeding? What think you of the then-existing state of prisons and prison discipline?' Unfortunate debtors confined indiscriminately with felons, in the midst of filth, vice, and misery unspeakable. Criminals under sentence of death, tippling in the condemned cell, with the ordinary for their pot companion. Flogging, a common punishment of women convicted of larceny. What say you of the times when London streets were absolutely dangerous, and the passenger ran the risk of being hustled and robbed even in the daytime? when not only Hounslow and Bagshot Heath, but
but the public road swarmed with robbers, and a stagecoach was as frequently plundered as a hen roost, when, indeed, the road was esteemed the legitimate resource of a gentleman in difficulties, and a highwayman was commonly called captain, if not respected accordingly. When cock-fighting, bear-baiting, and bull-baiting were popular, nay, fashionable amusements, when the bulk of the landed gentry could barely read and write, and divided their time between fox-hunting and guzzling, when a duelist was a hero, and when it was an honour to have killed your man, when a gentleman could hardly open his mouth without uttering a profane or filthy oath, when the country was continually in peril of civil war through a disputed succession, and two murderous insurrections, followed by more murderous executions, actually took place. This era of inhumanity, shamelessness, brigandage, brutality, and personal and political insecurity, what say you of it, Mr. Blankensop? Do you regard this wig and pigtail period as constituting the good old times, respected friend? There was Queen Anne's golden reign, sir, deferentially suggested Mr. Blankensop. A golden reign, exclaimed the statue, a reign of favoritism and court trickery at home, and profitless war abroad the time of Bolingbrokes and Harleys and Churchill's intrigues, the reign of Sarah, Duchess of Marlborough, and Mrs. Mesham, a golden fiddlestick. I imagine you must go farther back yet for your good old times, Mr. Blenkinsop. Well, answered the churchwarden, I suppose I must, sir, after what you say. Take William the Third's rule, persuaded the statue. War, war again, nothing but war. I don't think you'll particularly call these the good old times. Then what will you say to those of James the Second? Were they the good old times when Judge Jeffreys sat on the bench? When Monmouth's rebellion was followed by the bloody assize? When the king tried to set himself above the law, and lost his crown in consequence? Does your worship fancy that these were the good old times? Mr. Blenkinsop admitted that he could not very well imagine that they were. Were Charles the Second's the good old times? demanded the statue, with a court full of riot and debauchery, a palace much less decent than any modern casino, whilst Scotch covenanters were having their legs crushed in the boots, under the auspices and personal superintendence of His Royal Highness the Duke of York, the time of Titus Oates, Bedloe, and Dangerfield, and their sham plots, with the hangings, drawings, and quarterings, on perjured evidence that followed them, when Russell and Sidney were judicially murdered, the time of the great plague and fire of London, the public money wasted by roguery and embezzlement, while sailors lay starving in the streets for want of their just pay, the Dutch about the same time burning their ships in the Medway. My friend, I think you will hardly call the scandalous monarchy of the merry monarch the good old times. I feel the difficulty which you suggest, sir, owned Mr. Blenkinsop. Now that a man of your loyalty, pursued the statue, should identify the good old times with Cromwell's protectorate, is of course out of the question. Decidedly, sir, exclaimed Mr. Blenkinsop. He shall not have a statue, though you enjoy that honour. Bowing. And yet, said the statue, with all its faults, this era was perhaps no worse than any we have discussed yet. Never mind, it was a dreary, cant-ridden one. And if you don't think those England's palmy days, neither do I. There's the previous reign, then. During the first part of it, there was the king endeavouring to assert arbitrary power. During the latter, the Parliament were fighting against him in the open field. What ultimately became of him I need not say. At what stage of King Charles I's career did the good old times exist, Mr. Alderman? I need barely mention the Star Chamber and Poor and Prin. I merely allude to the state of Strafford and of Laud. In consideration, should you fix the good old times anywhere thereabouts? I'm afraid not, indeed, sir. Mr. Blenkinsop responded, tapping his forehead. What is your opinion of James I's reign? Are you enamoured with the good old times of the gunpowder plot, or when Sir Walter Raleigh was beheaded, 
or when hundreds of poor miserable old women were burnt alive for witchcraft, and the royal wiseacre on the throne wrote as wise a book in defence of the execrable superstition through which they suffered. Mr. Blenkinsop confessed himself obliged to give up the times of James I. Now then, continued the statue, we come to Elizabeth. There I've got you, interrupted Mr. Blenkinsop, exultingly. I beg your pardon, sir, he added, with a sense of the freedom he had taken, but everybody talks of the times of good Queen Bess, you know. Ha, ha, laughed the statue, not at all like Zamiel or Don Guzman or a Pavior's rammer, but really with unaffected gaiety. Everybody sometimes says very foolish things. Suppose everybody's lot had been cast under Elizabeth. How would everybody have relished being subject to the jurisdiction of the ecclesiastical commission, with its power of imprisonment, rack, and torture? How would everybody have liked to see his Roman Catholic and dissenting fellow subjects butchered, fined, and imprisoned for their opinions, and charitable ladies butchered too, for giving them shelter in the sweet compassion of their hearts? What would everybody have thought of the murder of Mary, Queen of Scots? Would everybody, would anybody, would you, wish to have lived in these days, whose emblems are cropped ears, pillory, stocks, thumbscrews, gibbet, axe, chopping-block, and scavenger's daughter? Will you take your stand upon this stage of history for the good old times, Mr. Blenkinsop? I should rather prefer firmer and safer ground, to be sure, upon the whole, answered the worshipper of antiquity, dubiously. Well, now, said the statue, tis getting late, and, unaccustomed as I am to conversational speaking, I must be brief. Were those the good old times when sanguinary Mary roasted bishops and lighted the fires of Smithfield? When Henry the Eighth, the British Bluebeard, cut his wives' heads off and burnt Catholic and Protestant at the same stake? When Richard the Third smothered his nephews in the tower? When the Wars of the Roses deluged the land with blood? when Jack Cade marched upon London, when we were disgracefully driven out of France under Henry the Sixth, or, as disgracefully, went marauding there under Henry the Fifth. Were the good old times those of Northumberland's rebellion, of Richard the Second's assassination, of the battles, burnings, massacres, cruel tormentings, and atrocities which form the sum of the Plantagenet reigns? of John's declaring himself the Pope's vassal, and performing dental operations on the Jews, of the forest laws and curfew under Norman kings. At what point of this series of bloody and cruel annals will you place the times which you praise? Or do your good old times extend over all that period, when somebody or other was constantly committing high treason, and there was a perpetual exhibition of heads on London Bridge and Temple Bar? It was allowed by Mr. Blenkinsop that either alternative represented considerable difficulty. Was it in the good old times that Harold fell at Hastings and William the Conqueror enslaved England? Were those blissful years the ages of monkery, of Odo and Dunstan, bearding monarchs and branding queens, of Danish ravage and slaughter, or were they those of the Saxon heptarchy and the worship of Thor and Odin? of the advent of Hengist and Horsa, of British subjugation by Romans? Or lastly, must we go back to the ancient Britons, Druidism, and human sacrifices, and say that those were the real, unadulterated, genuine good old times, when the true blue natives of this island went naked, painted with woad? Upon my word, sir, replied Mr. Blenkinsop, after the observations that I have heard from you this night, I acknowledge that I do feel myself rather at a loss to assign a precise period to the times in question. "'Shall I do it for you?' asked the statue. "'If you please, sir, I should be very much obliged if you would,' replied the bewildered Blenkinsop, greatly relieved. "'The best times, Mr. Blenkinsop,' said the statue, "'are the oldest. They are wisest, for the older the world grows, the more experience it acquires.' It is older now than ever it was. The oldest and best times the world has yet seen are the present. These, so far as we have yet gone, are the genuine good old times, sir. Indeed, sir? ejaculated the astonished alderman. 
Yes, my good friend, these are the best times that we know of, bad as the best may be, but in proportion to their defects they afford room for amendment. Mind that, sir, in the future exercise of your municipal and political wisdom. Don't continue to stand in the light which is gradually illuminating human darkness. The future is the date of that happy period which your imagination has fixed in the past. It will arrive when all shall do what is right. Hence none shall suffer what is wrong. The true good old times are yet to come. Have you any idea when, sir? Mr. Blenkinsop inquired, modestly. That is a little beyond me, the statue answered. I cannot say how long it will take to convert the Blenkinsops. I devoutly wish you may live to see them. And with that I wish you good night, Mr. Blenkinsop. Sir, returned Mr. Blenkinsop, with a profound bow, I have the honor to wish you the same. Mr. Blenkinsop returned home an altered man. This was soon manifest. In a few days he astonished the corporation by proposing the appointment of an officer of health to preside over sanitary affairs of Beetleberry. It had already transpired that he had consented to the introduction of Lucifer matches into his domestic establishment, in which previously he had insisted on sticking to the old tinder box. Next, to the wonder of all Beetleberry, he was the first to propose a great new school, and to sign a requisition that a county penitentiary might be established for the reformation of juvenile offenders. The last account of him is that he has not only become a subscriber to the Mechanics Institute, but that he actually presided thereat, lately, on the occasion of a lecture on geology. The remarkable change which has occurred in Mr. Blenkinsop's views and principles he himself refers to his conversation with the statue as above related. The narrative, however, his fellow townsmen receive with incredulous expressions, accompanied by gestures and grimaces of like import. They hint that Mr. Blenkinsop had been thinking for himself a little, and only wanted a plausible excuse for recanting his errors. Most of his fellow aldermen believe him mad, not less on account of his new moral and political sentiments, so very different from their own, than of his statue story. When it has been suggested to them that he has only had his spectacles cleaned, and has been looking about him, they shake their heads, and say that he had better have left his spectacles alone, and that a little knowledge is a dangerous thing, and a good deal of dirt quite the contrary. Their spectacles have never been cleaned, they say, and any one may see they don't want cleaning. The truth seems to be that Mr. Blenkinsop has found an altogether new pair of spectacles, which enable him to see in the right direction. Formerly he could only look backwards. He now looks forwards to the grand object that all human eyes should have in view, progressive improvement. End of A Tale of the Good Old Times from Pearl Fishing, Choice Stories from Dickens' Household Words. Mr. Bookman here. I hope you enjoyed today's audiobook. Don't forget to subscribe, like the video, and go ahead and tell us what you thought about the book in the comments. But more importantly, don't forget to check out the description. It's got a link in there that's going to give you access to over 200 ebooks. And we'll see you next time. And remember, you are appreciated.